So in keeping with the discussion of environmental public health, this lecture will be about the impact of air pollution on public health. So air pollution is the contamination of the air by noxious gases and the minute particles of solid and liquid matter, which are called particulates, and concentrations that are considered to endanger health. And some sources of outside air pollution include the combustion of gasoline and other hydrocarbon fuels in cars, trucks, and airplanes, burning of fossil fuels, for example, to heat your home, the use of insecticides and herbicides, as well as the dust that gets kicked up from fertilizers, and in particular regions, mining operations and livestock feedlots. And one of the things that often gets talked about is this idea of smog. And so smog is made up of particulates, often lead, as well as nitrous oxides, potassium, carbon monoxide, and often other toxic chemicals. And so this is the view, um, or one of the views of Manhattan. This is in the 1970s when there were more lax EPA regulations on air quality and more recent, and there's a similar picture that's been floating around social media um, as a result of some of the cuts that are being made to the EPA and concerns that individuals have about that. In addition to the outdoor air pollution, there are also sources of indoor air pollution, and these include things like bacteria, mold and mildew, viruses, um, animal dander, cat saliva, clams, dust, mites, cockroaches, and pollen that gets into the home, all of which can have an impact on your health. So this is a slightly older um, slide now, it's about maybe 10 years old, but it looks at what are considered the safe standard levels for particulate air pollution and looking at different cities and where they fall. So um, Los Angeles tends to be above, they have high smog days that you need to be concerned about, um, New York tends to be at or below, and then you have other countries around the world, um, quite a few that are in um, Asia and Southeast Asia that have incredibly high particulate air pollution, and they're starting to see the long-term negative consequences of that as well. And some effects that they can have on the environment by having this air pollution are things like acid rain, ozone depletion, and global warming, all of which, or which, at least global warming, we talked about previously in the previous lecture. So acid rain is basically rain that contains high levels of sulfuric and nitric acid. And by having those high levels, it can contaminate drinking water. And because that water from feeds into our crops, it can get brought up into our plants and so it can contaminate the vegetation. It damages aquatic life. Um, here's a picture of how acid rain has eroded a statue, it can erode buildings, and it can alter the chemical equilibrium of some soils, which means it can also have an impact on what can grow in those areas. It affects what we can eat. So when we look at the effect of indoor air pollution on our health, in 2004, indoor air pollution from solid fuel was responsible for about 2 million deaths, 3% of all deaths, and about 3% of global burden of disease. This risk factor is the second largest environmental contributor to ill health behind the combination of unsafe water with poor sanitation. And in low and middle income countries, about 4% of all deaths are due to indoor air pollution. Worldwide, indoor smoke from solid fuel combustion, so that's used for either heating your home or for cooking, causes about 21% of deaths from lower respiratory infections, 35% of deaths from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and 3% of deaths from lung cancer. And it does this by a number of different things. So for example, carbon monoxide can reduce the capacity of blood to carry oxygen, and symptoms associated with exposure to carbon monoxide include dizziness, nausea, headache, loss of consciousness, and in extreme cases, death. And persons or individuals with coronary artery disease and fetuses that are carried inside of the mother are particularly susceptible to carbon monoxide poisoning. Exposure to biological contaminants of indoor air that are related to dampness and mold increase the risk of acute and respiratory diseases, including asthma. And you see this more often in crowded areas, 
in areas where the buildings are older, um, and in particular low-income neighborhoods, both nationally and internationally. And radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking. And most cases of radon-induced lung cancer occur among smokers owing to the strong combined effect of both smoking and radon. And there are also impacts on health from outdoor air pollution. So in 2004, outdoor air pollution in urban areas was responsible for almost 1.2 million deaths, or 2% of all deaths globally, and 0.6% of the global burden of disease. Transportation-related air pollution, which is a significant factor or contributor to total urban air pollution, increases the risk of cardiopulmonary or heart and stroke-related disease and non-allergic respiratory diseases. Some evidence supports an association of transportation-related air pollution and increased risk of lung cancer, heart attack, and increased inflammatory response and adverse pregnancy outcomes, including low premature birth and low birth weight. Exposure to that particulate matter, including metals, has been linked to a range of adverse health outcomes, including modest transient changes in respiratory tract and impaired pulmonary function, pulmonary being your lungs, increased risk of symptoms requiring emergency room or hospital treatment, and increased deaths from cardiovascular respiratory diseases or lung cancer. Particulate matter is estimated to cause about 8% of deaths from lung cancer, 5% of deaths from cardiopulmonary disease, and 3% of deaths from respiratory infections. And short-term exposure to ozone are linked to effects on pulmonary function in the respiratory system, lung inflammation, increased medication use, hospitalization, and mortality. And reduced lung function has been associated with long-term ozone exposure. Short-term exposures to nitrogen dioxide, an indicator for complex mis mixture of many traffic-related chemicals, has been associated with effects on pulmonary function, increased allergic airway inflama inflammation reactions, hospital admissions, and re mortality. Reduced lung function and increased probability of respiratory symptoms are associated with long-term exposure to nitrogen dioxide. And so, as you can see, there are a number of potential risk factors, mainly to the respiratory and cardiopulmonary system, associated with both indoor and outdoor air pollution. And these effects can either be acute, so they happen right away, or they can be chronic or long-term, where they take a number of years to develop. And how can we reduce the risk? Well, we can make sure that we facilitate access to information on the health effects of both indoor and outdoor air pollution, as well as sharing methods for reducing the risk. We can conduct health impact assessments to determine the magnitude of the health effects associated with changes in the air pollution. And this information can and should be used to identify cost-effective measures to improve public health, identify critical uncertainties, and suggest productive areas of research. We should also try to facilitate actions to strengthen our air quality management. National governments have a responsibility to set needed policies and laws to implement them. Air pollution control regulations, especially those phasing out the use of leaded gasoline, controlling pollution from industrial processes, and promoting the use of cleaner and renewable energy should be enforced. National governments can help coordinate efforts across sectors and participate in regional as well as international commitments to increase, or I'm sorry, decrease air pollution. And when we specifically look at indoor air quality, we should be investigating effective interventions and implement methods for sustainable and financially viable changes to reduce indoor air pollution. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we watch Unnatural Causes, um, specifically place matters and does where you live increase your risk of death. We should encourage the substitution of solid fuels in the home by cleaner and more efficient energy fuels and technology, and this is particularly true for international um, or non-U.S. homes. We should encourage the use of improved stoves to lower pollution air levels in poor rural communities and developing countries where access to alternative fuels is limited and biomass remains the most practical fuel. We should make sure that we improve ventilation in homes, schools, and our working environments. Look at how we can change user um, behavior. So thinking about, again, those cooking methods primarily globally. 
should work to prevent immediate problems related to dampness and moles and housing to decrease the risk of exposure to hazardous microbes. And again, that particularly impacts um, lower income individuals both in the US and globally. And we should do our best to eliminate or reduce tobacco smoking indoors by prohibiting smoking in public buildings, as well as promoting risk reduction strategies um, when we're looking at things like indoor radon. Um, in terms of outdoor air quality, um, we should encourage technological innovation to decrease emissions from stationary sources and conventional vehicles and investigate alternative fuels. We can also, you know, think about how we implement control mechanisms such as emissions inspections. So New Jersey, you have to do an emissions inspections when you get your car inspected every year, but there are several states that no longer require inspections at all. So Michigan, for example, is a state where once you have your car, you never have to have it inspected again. Um, you can integrate environmental and health considerations in urban planning, including locating offices and commercial spaces in areas convenient for pedestrian and bicyclists in order to reduce the need for motorized transport, preventing traffic congestion, create green areas, separating pedestrians and bicycles from road traffic, and locating non-residential functions around urban highways. We can also focus on transportation systems that provide an alternative to cars and diesel buses, including rail, electric, or alternate fuel-powered buses, and bicycling and walking networks. We can promote the use of clean renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind-powered energy, and encourage movement away from, a movement away from dirtier, dirtier fuels, sorry, such as coal. And most importantly, maybe we can inform and accurately inform the public on effective pollution reduction strategies and those associated health benefits. And most of that work is being done through agencies like occupational OSHA, which is Occupational um, Safety and Health, um, the EPA, the USDA, and a lot of these governmental um, and federal regulatory agencies that are responsible for making sure that the environment in which we live is clean and healthy. And in order to do their work, they need to be funded um, and they need to be allowed to do their work. And so another reason for all, us, for all of us to be politically engaged and active and make sure that those agencies are allowed to do the work that they need to do. In the next lecture, we'll be discussing water pollution and the impacts on public health. And we will start to begin um, a discussion about the impact of lead poisoning in Flint, Michigan, as well as throughout the United States.